Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Vinny Politan. Great to have you aboard on this Thursday night. You know, one of the most compelling trials that we covered here on Court TV live last year was the death penalty murder trial of Florida versus Scott Nelson. Remember this guy? This Sunday on Judgment with Ashley Banfield, uh, she's going to take a deeper dive into the nanny abduction and murder trial. Nelson was sentenced to life in prison for the brutal kidnapping and murder of a wonderful woman. Jennifer Fulford was her name. She worked as a beloved nanny. Nelson took the stand twice, first during the guilt phase of the trial and then again in the penalty phase. And both times, I'll never forget, he was cold, he was callous, not even a bit remorseful about what he did to Jennifer Fulford. He was mostly focused on how he was a victim and how he was wronged in prison. Take a listen. The penal system in America is a spectacular failure. Nothing works. But everyone that drives by a prison, they glance at it real quick and keep driving. They may shudder. Oh, that's it. Oh, God. And thank God I'm not, thank God I'm not there. And keep on a roll. And nobody cares. Nobody cares what goes on in there. They'll spend $30,000 a year to keep you in jail, and they won't give you a nickel to keep you out. He is a man who believes he's been mistreated by the system, by everybody in his life. Jennifer Fulford died because this maniac wanted to air his grievances to the world. They turned me into an animal. I've been beaten. I've been chained to beds for days at a rip. I've been locked in cells that are so stifling hot. I have flashbacks to this very day. I've had cockroaches running over my body. I've been beaten. I've been raped. I've been everything in prison. And yet you did And here's, something. and now I'm out in and the yet. free world okay, and this hold guy on. Hold on. rips everything out. Yet you did something that will potentially put you in prison for the rest of your life or on death row. I couldn't help it. So it was all about the money then? All about the money. Isn't everything? Is that a yes? I had to eat. I'm a human being. Is that a yes? You're damn right it's yes. Evil, unlikable man. I mean, and, and I've never seen anything like it. All my years at Court TV, we were, we were absolutely shocked when we covered this. And joining us now, Court TV special contributor and the host of Judgment with Ashley Banfield, Ashley Banfield. This guy is bad news. Bad news. Wow. I mean, you can ascribe any word you want. Thug, animal, all of them apply. Uh, Scott Nelson is like, um, you know, like no one we've covered before. Um, the, the callousness with which he just mm, delivers the most unnerving testimony. Um, and by the way, Vinny, we don't get a lot of, you know, people taking the stand when they're defendants. So this was joyous in one respect, because I always love that window into the soul and personality of a killer. What makes them tick? What makes them fly so far afield of the flock? But this one, this one is one of those things where I just think about, um, did I lock every door? Have I locked all the windows too? When I think of Scott Nelson, that's what goes through my mind. He is, um, you know, when you think about what he did and why he did, it, it shouldn't have, there was no reason for it. There was no, no reason for what he did. And the woman was just a wonderful, wonderful person. Yeah, a, just a, com a, a completely blameless victim, just wrong place, wrong time. He set his sights on someone, just like in the Pettit murders in Connecticut. Those two men just chose that family random. They just saw them, and that was it, you know? And, and that was sort of what this beast did. He spotted a woman in a wealthy neighborhood and thought, I'm going to get back at these people, these rich people, because my life is awful. Um, and what was so sort of astounding is that he talked so much after he committed such an awful crime, kidnapping her, uh, Jennifer Fulford, a, a nanny, you know, just doing her job, kidnapping her, throwing her in the trunk, robbing her at the ATM, and then deciding, I don't want to witness, so I'll just suffocate her with duct tape and then stab her a number of times and she'll be dead and I'll throw her in the woods. Don't know who she is, don't care. All these rich people deserve this. That was essentially his testimony. And you don't have to you know, hear it from me, you can hear it from him. I wanna just show you uh, something that we, we're gonna include in the, in the documentary this uh, Sunday night on Judgment on Court TV. It's the 
statements that he made to the to the pe- to the pl- police um, about what he did afterwards. Like he needed some pizza, he was hungry, and this is how he put it. This is an innocent woman who did nothing wrong, who was brutally killed by Nelson, and he could talk about it with no emotion, with no remorse, no anger, no sadness, no anything. It's just what I did. And in some ways, he thought it was funny. So then I, uh, I sat there and I thought about what I've done, everything, and uh, I thought about what I've done, everything, and I was hungry. I went into 7-Eleven and I ordered a pizza. Well, I, I, I called it the blood pizza. Okay. I finally had a certain level of, of self-respect. I felt like good. I finally made someone pay for all the I've been through. And so I, I took my blood pizza, and I'm walking down the street while all these rich people are walking around buying jewelry, and they're having their good life. And little do these know what, what I had to do for this friggin' pizza. And I ate that pizza, every bite of it, and I enjoyed every and I really did. My only regret is that I hadn't killed 30 more sons of bitches later because I wish I had. Well, that just played out in court too. Remember, Vinny, just how maniacal he was on the stand? I mean, do you remember how it was just sort of jaw-dropping to to listen to him and the things that he said? We thought it was going to only be on tape, but it ended up also, you know, being on the witness stand, do you recall, like, what were your feelings, Vinny, when you saw well, this? Did you expect this sort of thing? No, no. We were all wondering, is he going to testify? And if he does, what is he going to say? And it was, it was so, it was so much about him. He was so much wrapped mm. up in himself. And I did get a sneak peek of that, though, because he had posted some YouTube videos uh, where he was kind of doing his rant, like, the world is out to get me and it's my parole guy and it's this, everyone, you know, I'm just trying to make it. I'm just a guy just trying to make it. And mm, at the end mm. of the day, you know, I think he was motivated by wanting to be locked up again. And, and that's... Well, you know, listen, I think there was a lot of mental illness with this guy. He may not have, uh, um, you know, presented that way, but man, oh man, when you hear him talk, uh, and, and he was super obstinate on the stand. So I want to show this one moment um, from the court that appears in the documentary where he, you know, he became belligerent um, under, you know, uh, under cross-examination. He just did not want to work with the, the the court at all, even though he was happy to just vomit all of the confession information to the police. But he got real obstinate um, on the on the stand uh, and yet said, well, come on. I mean, I made this real easy for you. I just I, I you didn't do any work. It's not like you had to police this thing. Take a look. Force your way into the house. I don't recall any of this stuff right now, ma'am. Did you have a knife with you when you went into the house? Ma'am, you better check the confession. I mean, what more do you want? I mean, did I make it easy enough? It wasn't great police work that got me here. I gave it all to you. You want the truth? I'll give you the truth. So help me God, I don't remember. I can't remember everything. There's something wrong with my brain. Usually, the lawyers try to hide the rantings of a madman. You don't get to hear those in court a lot of the time. If they were hoping that somehow somebody on the jury would have compassion on him, well, he certainly didn't do himself any favors. I mean, I, I would assume you had the same feeling, Vinny, watching that, just like, whoa, what, what, first of all, what's his defense attorney saying, <laughs> listening to all of this. Well, he hated them as much as the, the, the prosecutor. I mean, every, you know, he didn't trust anybody. He wanted to be his own lawyer, but then all of a sudden they would jump in and they would jump out. You know, what did he want to do? Do you want to present any evidence? You know, he was very controlling and, and very much just about him. And I really think the goal, there were two goals, one to get locked up. And the second goal was just to have a moment where people have to listen to him. Yeah. Well, and he also wanted to blame the world, right? I think he that was his mission. Listen to me so that I can project all y'all's fault in why I had to kill some random woman that I just saw, you know, walking into her her house. Um, and, and I think that was what was so remarkable to me, that he was so intent on blaming, I think, his probation officer, you know, that that's the reason that Jennifer Fulford's dead is because of how my probation. Well, here's how he put it. Have a listen. Julio Dominguez is employed by the U.S. Department of Justice, United States 
probation office in Orlando, Florida. And how is he related to this case? Well, well, sir, he was my probation officer. I was on supervised release. Okay, and what is it, the importance of his involvement in this case? Well, sir, I'll be very frank with you. Um, Jennifer Lynn Fulford would be alive today had it not been for Julio Dominguez. Any and reason for that statement, sir? I think the uh, world should know that. I mean, it's justice. The truth should be known, sir. I don't believe I have any further questions. Cross-examination. Mr. Dominguez was a federal probation officer? That's correct. Okay. And Mr. Dominguez, according to your statement, is the individual responsible for Jennifer Fulford's death? Yes. Did Mr. Dominguez kill Jennifer Fulford? No. Who killed Jennifer Fulford? I did. All right. I don't believe I will ever have another moment in a courtroom like I did when he was asked who killed Jennifer Fulford, and he said, I did. Where do you go from there? What do you do? You just start talking about the facts. And his cross-examination, I think, perfectly demonstrated his personality. He wanted to talk about what he wanted to talk about. Did he ever? Um, and Vinny, I, I can't help but think when I see him, and I just I try to gaze into those eyes, and I, I try to think of where are you going with this? Like, where does your logic come from? I go back to 1994, because back then, presumably before he met that um, probation officer, um, what was the impetus for kidnapping his own father and forcing his own father? father to withdraw $10,000 from a bank and then say, well, it was just a family uh, dispute. So clearly, I mean, as if we needed any proof, I don't think it had much to do with the probation officer. No. And, and all these allegations that he was making throughout the trial were completely fabricated. There was, there was nothing to back, back it up. And he had this story that he wanted to tell about how he was wronged by all these people and he was going to use this trial to out them. But None of it made sense. He didn't connect the, the pieces. He didn't connect the dots, but tried to portray himself as a victim, but never, never said, I didn't do it. I mean, we just heard right. him say he did it. And it was, it was bizarre. It was strange. Uh, and it was a death penalty case. Yes. And again, you're so right. I mean, I kind of feel like, wow, are we ever down a rabbit hole where we don't need to be, right? It's like, even if Jennifer Furlfoot, who'd never seen Scott Nelson in her life, she was just she was just some passerby in the moment, completely unrelated to his gripes and issues. She was a, a victim in every sense, completely blameless. So even if she had been part of the blame, so to speak, I'm not sure where he gets off saying that this was his righteous, um, you know, revenge on the system for whatever had wronged him in his life. I I deserve to be able to kill someone. I, I mean, it was just nutty right from start to finish. But if it, if it weren't so horribly tragic for Jennifer Fulford, um, I would laugh all the way through it thinking, what a nut. But this nut was a dangerous nut. And you're right. It was a death penalty case. And it doesn't get more serious than that. And I know that our viewers probably share this, this uh, emotion, because I know I have felt this, rightly or wrongly. And that is when somebody um, is facing a death penalty and they're convicted and they say, well, I would prefer death because I don't want to sit in a prison cell for the next several decades. That would be way worse for me. You instantly sort of think, well, I really hope they, you know, give you death, you know, because we don't want you to be the arbiter of what you want. We don't want you to be satisfied. We want you to be punished. And I can think of a few examples, you know, that have really stood out in all my years. I mean, Timothy McVeigh, that was one, right, for the history books, the Oklahoma City bomber. That guy also decided to, um, uh, just do away with any of his appeals other than the, the mandatory ones and just sort of marched himself right off to death row within years of blowing up the Oklahoma City building uh, and killing well over 150 people. Um, the other one that, that really stood out to me was Eileen Warnos. There was someone else that, you know, uh, serial killer, thought to be America's first serial killer. We covered this on on judgment. She also was in death penalty trial, did herself no favors on the stand, did herself no favors in the courtroom with her 
crazed outbursts and then ultimately did away with, you know, the appeals and just allowed the death you know, penalty process to um, to carry through. But then there was Jody Arias, because that's a young woman who drove us all crazy uh, with her weeks and weeks and weeks on the stand and her gaslighting everybody. And she in the in the process between being convicted and the penalty and the in the penalty phase, the death penalty phase, she gave an interview, uh, which was sort of astounding, to, to KSAZ, the Fox affiliate, um, the Fox station in Arizona, Fox 10 in Arizona, in which she sort of articulated that thing. Well, you might as well just kill me now because I don't want to have to live out my long life in jail. Have a listen. The worst outcome for me would be natural life. I would much rather die sooner than later. Longevity runs in my family, and I don't want to spend the rest of my natural life in one place. Um, you know, I'm pretty healthy, I don't smoke, and I would probably live a long time. Um, I said years ago that I'd rather get death than life, and that still is true today. Mm, well, uh, that didn't happen, and the jury ultimately, whether you agree or not, if you're viewing at home, um, the jury said, no, you will live out that natural life in a jail cell. Don't know whether they wanted to do that uh, in a punitive um, decision or whether they had serious issues with the death penalty in this case. But I think that was slightly satisfying for a lot of people. She, uh, you know, ended up, you know, changing her mind. Then you'll probably remember. And she stood up and, you know, appealed to the jury and did her Jody Arias thing, talking about how she teaches Spanish to inmates and she's a good person, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe she got that one person. I will say this. There was that one person on Scott Nelson's jury, one holdout that decided that uh, death wouldn't be the choice, that he should spend the rest of his natural life locked up. And that's what happened there. But there is this lesson that I can't repeat enough. The Scott Nelson story that's airing on, on Sunday night on Court TV on Judgment with Ashley Banfield is that story that will make you shudder in your own home and make you go and check to make sure the door is locked. And it will make you think, I'm not gonna open the door ever unless I know who's on the other side. Because when Jennifer Fulford opened the door of the place where she was a nanny, that man, that man, that stranger who had nothing to do with her, no ties, no connection, he was the one on the other side of the door who just picked her randomly and thought, here's how I'll get back at the world. And it just, it just defies logic. It absolutely does. Ashley, Sunday night, 8 p.m. We'll all be watching. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome.